this is going, so he's going to be hearing us chit chat for the beginning. Um, but yeah, we can just get going. I think John, Jeff, you guys signed on now. Is everybody here? Yeah. Hey, hey, good morning. Hey. Yes, hey, I, I will try to. Uh, uh, I know this isn't probably empty promise coming from me, but uh, I will. Right. Well, Eric said you were here for the comic relief mostly, so uh, you know you got to look at some. Uh, yeah, yeah, you have pinpointed my talents <laughs> accurately. Um, <laughs> as far as the recording goes, uh, there's what happened is uh, there is what's called the WebEx WebEx meeting space. It will auto generate an email and invite the attendees to go to that meeting space again. Uh, but it will ask you for a password. Uh, we tell you, it's kind of funny how it works. And then you can watch uh, the recording in the WebEx meeting space. In print, you can download the recording in the WebEx format. There are applications that convert it. It's, it's a it's a big point. Uh, so if you have any trouble, if you guys want to watch the recording and run into trouble, then contact us. We have, if better, we have done that. Okay. Uh, Mike, Mike, we're saving it for is our IT at the Kimley plant. He does the IT, so he'll figure it out. Yeah, and I, I think I'm going to recording now uh, already. Um, so I think I think this is going. So it's all going well, and I did this right, and then should have you up in this. Okay. Thank you. Um, so let me get rid of this. And go ahead and put some things on your screen here. Um, but hopefully, I did share the screen already. You guys seeing my screen? Hopefully, you're seeing like a little alien here. Yeah. Yes, yeah, you on the screen. That's it. You see on the screen? Yeah, that's a good likeness of me there. Kabuk, uh, NCAD, and that lizard. Yep, yep. Yeah, that's okay, good. So, you guys are seeing my screen. This is, uh, you know, Kobus NCAD here, uh, which you're looking at. Uh, and, you know, you guys showed us your process there in, in Alpha Cam. Um, what was that? On Monday, maybe? Uh, or something really this week. My, my day blending together, anyway. Um, yeah, but uh, so you showed us that portion, you know, and, and then after that, you guys are kind of interested in seeing, you know, do everything that you had done in, in AppCam, basically, uh, in, in something we had, and we kind of quickly went into the COBA CCAD direction, and John, John did on that. Um, and yesterday was, I quickly put together, uh, you know, from the examples that you guys had shown us, uh, or that had, had been sent to us, I put together some examples, you know, and it's not going to be like 100%, and I didn't do... 100% of everything that's in the examples, but I took them to a point where I thought, you know, this is a concept that, you know, it can do something similar uh, or maybe better than what Alpha Cam did. You know, of course, every software is a little bit different and the learning curve to get used to, you know, how does it do it? But, uh, when you guys were showing this Alpha Cam, I realized that, you know, there were certain things that were different the way you currently did it than you know, how I would do it in NCAT, but it, it was all possible and doable in, in, in kind of what I was seeing there, and I, I think I mentioned that. Um, so any more talking, um, you know, here at this point, I think, is, is open up um, some of these files that I that I made. And the, the one that, you know, we, we spent most of our time in was, this, was the LAN, right? So you can source the preview on the right side, um, which should mimic very closely, you know, that that. End. that you guys were showing us. And of course, you know, what you're seeing here that's different is uh, on the XF file, you, you have like six, five or six different, uh, you know, bottom zero. Right? Like how, how would the, uh, the toe kick be different? And you're seeing one of these iterations now. Uh, all the other machining, which I think was a little bit more static. Um, so, you know, I think there was something, if I recall correctly, that the drills, you know, maybe there was only one of these or two sets. I don't exactly remember all the details, um, but there were some parametrics in here or some odds that you could choose. Okay, now do, do, do the two, two holes. Or, um, and, of course, the big um, was, you know, switching between the different 
uh, fix here. Um, X is, is pretty static, uh, except for everything should, of course, grow in, in length and width. So that's probably the first thing I'm going to do here is uh, um, you know, I want to prove that this is all parametric based on options that I will update. So, for instance, if I switch the, you know, the length a little bit easier, I, got, I would say. I think I'm out here. Why? Um, is anyone else kicked out or can you guys still see? Everybody else can still see? We'll see. Hey, Randy, how do we get you back in here? Oh, I'm good. I think I'm good now. I logged on my uh, personal computer instead of through the remote desktop. I was having problems. Now I'm you, there looking at it again. You can see my mouse moving again and everything? I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, so the, the first thing I just wanted to prove you know, is, you know, it's part of this metric. Uh, you know, that's, of course, the idea is that, you know, some tensions are coming in and, and we're going to be to, you know, have rules in place that, that update accordingly. So if I change, um, you know, the link to something a little bit longer, and, you know, let's just kind of make this a little bit bigger in general. And we that you can see that, uh, you know, a lot wider and a lot taller. And you can see, for instance, like the drill holes here, you know, a rule that says basically stay constrained to, to the top of this um, about two inches away or three inches. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the dimension was anymore. A uh, saw blade here that I used at the top. Um, we haven't been a saw blade for, for you guys, but again, I just wanted to get them together here. And of course, this data here for the back, the backboard, you know, it extended in width to, to stay, you know, it would cut out through the top uh, with a constraint here on the bottom that, you know, it's I don't know, five inches maybe. Be from from what I'm here. So this this remained the same. So I'll do it one more, more time and switch this back to something like Now the width you can see again the the journey. And if we we change this you know length, uh, let's say we're making something like uh, like a top. Then you know how how that updates. So. Uh, you know, the drill holes are updating parametrically, too. What I did here was say, okay, this is constrained to the bottom where the first drill hole is right to the center, and then automatically calculate how many I need for that at 32 millimeter spacings. And from up here, you know, we say, okay, there's an offset where from there we don't want any drill holes. Mm -hmm. uh, so th this is parametric. You know, everything's been, been set up correctly. And how all that was done, you can see over here in this canvas, which becomes very important. This is where all of this, this work was done. Um, so, you know, to keep this organized, uh, I'll just kind of go from top to bottom. What you see here in the, in the green is what we call variables. Um, so there are internal variables, like if we look at the work piece. So every here in the brackets, the square brackets, these are internal variables. So as soon as I add this work piece into Hamlet, these internal variables become active afterwards, right? So then I can say, reference the length, I can just say, uh, I can just use L or the reference the, the and just use this internal variable B and thickness, et cetera, right? So these, these are things that I can call later on in my formulas. So for instance, if I just want to say, but put the second set of drill holes at at the width minus two inches, my formula for that would be B minus four inches, right? So instead of going to type out, you know, as 24 minus four inches, I just reference the internal variable. Um, then that whole explanation was to explain that then we can create our own variables that aren't used by, you know, the, the symbols or the macros, such as the workpiece one, that already come in built in. in yeah, then we can create our own. And I'm this here, for instance, to say, uh, we'll hear this take type. Um, you know, if you can imagine the, the acronym, that's the top type. And I have that for two. One here for, for which is two inches. And then I have one here for the drill number. Uh, so those were kind of the, the options that I decided I would do for this demo. Uh, from what I remember saying that you guys had kind of had those options. And, in Alcam. So, 
what these internal variables mean allows us to do. So I can now quickly say, R1, you know, the tick type 2, which is this particular one with this uh, has arc on it. Let's say I want, you know, our most standard to kick type, and you can see that that switch to, you know, a fish to kick here, and I think it's about three inches in this case. And I'm, I even have a, a third type, which is, you know, the arc at the bottom. Now, you guys had four and five and six uh, potentially different token types. Uh, I did not create those because I think, you know, as of concept, you can say, okay, switching between yeah. these different ones is, uh, is switching, you know, between the different token types. In an if-then statement, then, correct? That's correct. So that's what's going on below. Uh, the data mm -hmm. are not here, not in a condition, and not as the backboard data, other than to say, you know, it's parametric to extend it to the, to the length of the, uh, the part. But then you can see as we get a little bit further down, here's the if conditions uh, start where it says toe kick type equals one to this set of lines. If toe kick type equals two, then, you know, now we can actually see a line red highlighted as I go down uh, through them and come and complete the perimeter cut. And if three, then, you know, do their settle. May I interject something here, Alex, which may not be entirely clear just by looking at it. Um, what you're seeing is what's called the expert mode in uh, If you, you can turn expert mode off and then you only see the graphical representation of the work piece and you can work in, in that entirely. Uh, you all uh, introduce all your meaning and real holes and, and so forth. And not see the formulas at the code on the left side. Uh, we can just work in the code, and it will automatically create the graphical representation. We, what you're bringing up is a is a good point. Um, which I'll something later. You know, it depends on. You know, there's probably two types of work here that might occur. You know, there's the initial setup of this. You know, what I did yesterday. Uh, you know, so somebody is creating these these templates, or maybe we're importing them somewhere else and then adding some for them. And that might be the usage on a daily basis, where you know, do you potentially really want to give access to all of this, you know, things stuff or this geometry to to everybody who might be, you know, what their their skill level is and how much. Uh, that is something that you can control, which I think is. Uh, the point that John is making. Uh, I have a question that you're, uh, um, you're mentioning there. Uh, you know, scenarios where we do one-off pieces that's hmm. outside of the nesting. Um, so could this replace alpha cam with a hole? Yeah. In other words, if we had to do something unique, could we draw it, uh, do one-off and post code for it? Yes, you could. So, uh, um, oops. Uh, you know, so that was something that I made yesterday. I didn't start from any of the template that I had on hand. I made. I started completely from scratch. You know, okay. so we know some, let's go to a new file, make a new piece, right? Um, okay, so this is in millimeters here. I don't know if you guys are working in meters or inches, but we can just, uh, you know, get the inch symbol at the end, and you have a 32 inch by 24 piece. And now we can start, you know, laying out, uh, you know, these different. So let's see, you know, this is completely on the fly here, as, as quickly as I can, right? I have the, the mm -hmm. circle, and I want to pocket it out. Uh, I'm just going to quickly, you know, just draw on geometry here and add in this case. So this would be the difference between, you know, the professional and just the basic version, is that the basic version of Cobus does not come with these CAD drawing tools. But, you know, we're just talking about arcs and lines here, really, and the CAD just, you know, gives a lot more options to do that. Quickly. Um, so one now in this case is, is uh, I'm just turning this into a contour, which it decided to call their score K1. And turn that CAD into something that the the machine will recognize, and now I can say let's potentially do uh, or something on like that. So um, you know this is called underscore K1. So this is my reference to the contour that I'm using. Uh, I'm now selecting the tool that I want to use. You know, this is just 
normal information that you will need to now do a pocket. So what is the depth of the time pocket going to be? Is there an overlap with how often, you know, the overlap on the tool? Uh, to that, you know, there isn't like a skin left behind. So in this case, we're overlapping by by 60% of the previous route. Um, you know, is it doing these these onion skinning steps as it as it plunges in? There's these different options, of course, in this this, this thing symbol uh, you can choose from. But one of the things that I'm going to show you guys later is that these dialogues are not set in stone. But you know, you're you're seeing like a a dialog box here, for instance, that uh, like a field here, like the survey Z that you guys never use, and you, you just find that it's confusing. The dialog can be edited to remove that field. We're here for some, for instance, like, like using a particular setting, like the feed rate, for instance, isn't in this particular dialog, right? Then we that field in, so you can control it while you're creating the machine. So these dialogs are actually 100% customizable. You can see that they put an image over here to to help with, you know, what exactly is this thing. So it gives you like a graphic, you know, tip or hint. And you, know, you can do uh, pull menus and fields and, and radio buttons and check mark boxes. Completely customizable. Things that you guys can control. Uh, may, I, may I point that out, Alex, that there are multiple tabs. You know, you, you're showing yep. only the first one. Is a bunch of others. Yeah. So the, usually on tab one, you're going to see the most important things for finishing you know, off this particular machining. And in this case, you know, I wanted to make this, this pocket really quick. So this was now, you know, if I hadn't been talking, that would have taken me probably 10 seconds to make it completely one off part, right? Yeah. I mean, good, good enough for the one off part. I mean, of course, uh, have yep. all the different machining functions you need, you know, milling, drilling, pockets, uh, blade coats, but yeah, you, you can you can create whatever you want uh, in Cobus and get. And, and there is a drawing, so you the DXA file, you can certainly import and that start from the purchase mm -hmm. to machining to it. But right. it also work. You don't have to do it, but quite honestly, the importing. Uh, it's a very yep. complicated work piece. You saw how, how quickly it was able to create that work piece from scratch with a pocket. M many times the import is not the worst of the time if it's just, if it's really a, a one-off. You can so one question I have is an anchor. So going um, in Alpha Cam, we have what you call constraining. How do you? Apart, or tell it, you know, those holes have to be from the edge, or so. Is it, is it auto constraining based on how you're setting it, or how is that working? That's one thing in Alpha Cam uh, that I saw yesterday that you guys were doing with those constraints that I actually thought was uh, kind of interesting. Now, I don't know exactly how those constraints were, were set up. Most likely, create a constraint based on a formula or something like that. Is that, is that correct? It's, vi it's very time consuming. So, okay. can you tell me this auto constraints? Like, you, you you say a line is parallel or it's vertical or it's horizontal. You have to say it's coincident. You have to connect everything. It doesn't automatically do it. You're basically drawing pencil and then going back and constraining the features of the line. Um, I, I, it's, Inca doesn't do that way. I, I wouldn't say there's something similar to, to the constraints, it, it's all based upon the formula. You know, so you asked about the drill holes, and maybe that's the, the best one to kind of get started on, right? You know, I was talking about these internal variables before. So here we can say a, a really simple if condition. If drill equals one, then do this particular set of drill holes. Else, if, it, if it equal one, basically, then the other one. And the, this was connected to this variable so is that what is the value of this drill and if I now set this to one then the top one disappears, right? So we already mm -hmm. talked about that condition uh how, that we're doing if conditions to to complete them. So now let's switch it back to two because you're kinda of wondering how did I say, you know, if this is parametric and I change the, the 
the work needs to mention to be, you know, 40. It obviously stayed the distance away from, the, you know, the edge of the safe of this park. And it's a very simple thing to set up. You just go into that row of holes and you say, you see in this particular row, uh, this macro for, for drillings, you can say uh, the Y position of row one is, is two inches. And So you're and you have that diet that go back into that that uh spot with the original direction. You're just picking you want the origin to be from, correct? That, that's correct. Too, yeah. So th this, for instance, with switch now that the, it is symmetrical. So if switch is to the top left corner, we would see the exact same thing. Um, you know, so it's not the best example for this. But your your parametrics here, you can see again that your Y is not on row one. You can see again the graphic helps. They've got two inches mm -hmm. on there. And the y position on root row two, I simply said, this is e. Remember the internal variable for width must two inches. So that's how you constrain it. Really, you say, okay, the second row I want to go up to b, and then bring in two inches again, and it'll always stay stuck to the formula, basically. So okay. this is all formula driven. Okay. I'm not setting up a line. Like I saw in Alpha Cam, where I saw like a line, I, I kind of think, and you were like, okay, now I got to connect it to that line. You just straight into the field. Mm -hmm. Boom, it's done, right? So that's a fairly primitive example now. You know, sometimes, you know, there, math, of course, does get involved in the work we do. And, you know, for something, for instance, like this arc here is a good example. I didn't know exactly how you guys did this. Uh, you know, did you always constrain it to the, 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 all the riser? You know, the riser are always the same in, in between the width of the of the part. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so that's a question for you guys. I, I just kind of assumed that it was always constrained at about, you know, this four inches up or whatever, right? Yep. But I put in here a formula here where you can see, or a variable here where I say, you know, this, this is my riser. I can change that. And if I accept, you can see that this riser is, is changing, right? So that takes mm -hmm. a little bit of math because you're obviously I'm changing a radius. I'm, yep. I'm not just missing this riser. There's a, there's a radius that is changing your arc. I'm still a variable driven, right? So we're here in this, uh, this arc. Here I've, I've set up some. I raise this my r okay times 25.4 for the for the. But you can see I did a lot of math here. Uh, you know, to figure out what this formula is going to be, wherein the my rate radius is calculated by, you know, a mathematical formula that determines what this is going to be from the information provided to me, which is uh, laser and the length. And then, yeah, I did a formula here then to figure out what, from the information, what the radius is going to be. And that's what then I entered it in to create this arc. It's like what I'm seeing is you could, if you had a complex equation, you could create a variable at the top, mm. or you could just punch the equation straight into the yep. x and y value. That right? That is 100% correct. Now, I, I broke it into these kind of different where I did a little bit of work first, you know, just to make it a little bit cleaner for me, uh, you know, because when you get into like a long, you know, job, you know this right as a math guy, when, when you get into really long equations and okay like how many things do I have in parentheses do I have enough do I have the closing parentheses so it was a little bit cleaner and easier for me to, to kind of break it up into the one two three and then the, the I'm just using these variables that I used that I created before and I'm just kind of racing all the formulas with the variables yep. that, that just kind of condense it all together right that's my reference as well I like simply it as opposed yep. to running a long chain. So, um... Alex, Alex, thank you for pointing out that I may know something. You know math. Yeah, I know you know math. I definitely <laughs> look to you for math stuff. Um, I mean, I probably got the most com uh, you know, complicated, constraint kind of thing I did in this particular example. You know, the, the other one, like, the dip has a constraint on it. Uh, and we look at the drills again. I did these, these well, can, we, can we like one of the lines? I know this is going to sound simple. Go to one of those lines or solve like cut. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like Alex. So do you tell it that it's 
horizontal? Are you basically defining a start and end point and it's in horizontal? Like what keeps that from turning you know, angle? You're 100 percent correct. correct. You can see my start x is 5.219 inches and my end point x is 5.219. So that that tells okay. it's it's straight line down. Okay. Like an example where we would have to consume that, that line. We would have to tell it it's vertical and that it's X amount. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Oh yeah, I think I think in this case I didn't know how Kim was like that, but in this case I think we're saving you time. You just you punch it in yeah. the, unless a user goes in and changes it, it's gonna stay that way. Good. Um yeah, there's much more on this. I mean so this was uh you know, the thing that we talk about and of course the big thing here is is changing, you know, between the different token types and we can quickly look at this in simulation which uh you know, similar to the alpha cam I was saying that uh, you know that was running, but mm -hmm. you know you can speed this up a little bit. But this is I would say is you know, extremely accurate. Um we've even had big companies ask us to do time trials. Uh, being the simulation and then, you know, actually running something on the machine. Uh, H and I don't know if we're fine. That rings a bell. They ask us to do time trials. But you can see uh, then if we go to this timing tab, it then breaks up these sums of operations, right? You know, how long is it actually going to take? Uh, times is a changing tool, so we got three tool changes. And this kind of breakdown of everything that it's doing, you know, within this operation. So most of this here is going to be, you know, all these drills that it's doing in this case, but you know something that we also can do in this station is give you you know estimate on the time that we think the machine is going to take. Mm hmm Okay, so that was the big example with the end. any questions on that one? Uh Eames? No, pretty good there. Okay. Good. Uh, sorry? I just good. Okay, so you know, two more examples here. Uh, uh, and the first one I made is, is then called door, right? So this was more on, you know, what Jeff showing us. Uh, and, and this wasn't 100% right the way you guys made your doors, but I think you will see when we look at the simulation that, uh, you know, in in practice here, similar to what you guys made, right? I mean, it's just a door. Um, and there's, there's all these kind of... Uh, you know, here on on these individual line ones that you saw first was what Jeff was showing us when it was kind of ramping out there, uh, you know, to kind of really complete that corner really nicely, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then the angle that it's coming in, you know, this is just kind of random. I did by a length, but you know, if I can control the lead and the lead out, how, how it's going to be coming out of that board to make that nice, smooth, you know, angled... Uh, that old exit so that it was, you know, it had a nice tight right corner there, right? Uh, then we control it by the angle itself. Like, what over the distance, like, how far is it coming out and, and ramping out? Um, so this example was really mostly to show, you know, what I'm doing there on those individual little lines where it's where it's coming out to clean that out. Um, everything else here, these other ones, you're kind of doing... All the different profiles around these are done as as long. You can see it now doing a long continuous one, right? As around with the tool. Uh, the thing here again with these contours is that I really only set up contour. So that's here in this construction layer to do one milling, and then everything else I didn't have to read all the lines. I just did. Um, of the original contour and just said, oh, this is 15 millimeters further away from that other one. Let's just do that manipulation and then put a um, ending around that one. And I did the same with this one, right? Kind of out away from the original one so that I didn't have to redraw, you know, those five lines over, you know, three more times or two more times, actually. Mm -hmm. So you can use the contours in Cobus Incat. I don't know if Alphacam does. Is that you can use the same contour manipulations on it. Like you could, uh, like here, offset it. You could rotate it. You could change the, the entry point. Is uh, all these different things you can still do to contour 
static thing. It's something that can be manipulated. So, <clears throat> any question on this door? It's all simpler than than the end uh, that we have. It's RJ. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right. Good. Good. He's okay. You think up yeah, then? So, so the last example then was you know something that's a little bit harder on, on these doors, which uh, I think I just called here door cathedral. Um, now what I used here to to give you know a complete uh, that's not the right word you know but to hide anything from you guys, I use a pretty geared um, that has and built. I'm going to show that now. If I go here to Universal and Contour, you'll see under this pull down menu, there are all these pre configured geometries, as they call them. So you can see, you know, there's your normal rectangle, there's a one, and of course, is what oh, guy will arc in, in the you know, in, in Germany where the software was made, which we would probably call, you know, cathedral or something. Um, you know, here's something like a gothic, uh, a gothic style. So I'll use this one. I did to mathematically create all this on my own because uh, I found that the Incan did a pretty good job, in my opinion, of doing it itself. So we see here this particular macro here was, was put together here called the Sigma Arc. Or the, uh, you know, the cathedral arc here, and you see kind of how they put this, this, this there. So, you know, there's certain uh, field parameters that we can say. You know, is there an angle? Okay, so no, there's no angle on this. If I, of course, set this to 45, you'll you'll notice it rotates, of course, right? Um, so you know, all these different settings. Then we we select height and the width, which here I'm doing a bit of a, a formula on that. Um, and then, you know, there was a lot of discussion or discussion when, when we met, when we were looking at the DSFs, okay, that there is this kind of lengthening that's going, which I, I believe the formula is 1 16th of the total length of the of the, the horse, right? So I have this for likely being calculated out, but just, just to prove a point, we can write in here, you know, 20 or, or 40, and then millimeters, of course. And that it is extending out, you know, a straight part of that. Uh, you know, give us that, that that straight part. Now, of course, you know what I used here was this this length, which can lead out to a sixteenth of the uh, full length of the arc. Which what I saw in the DXF that, that I was provided. Now, the, the radius themselves, uh, I didn't know exactly what you guys did here, but this inbuilt. Uh, macro uh, gives you two options to that. One option is to do it by radius. The other one is to do it by a height and proportion. Now, fun, looking at what I and what I remember from our from his presenting to us, I believe it was kind of an equal radius uh, type mode going on where I used the radius as the center was 100, and the on the external right here, right, was about 100. So that should give me an equal radius here and an equal radius here, and meets in the middle, of course, right in the middle. I think that's what I recall on from our demo. Correct. Um, yeah, even if it's not, this was, like I said, uh, as my, you know, professional, let's say, uh, at the beginning of, of looking at this point, I used an inbuilt macro. Now, the macro was created by somebody, and I have full access to changing that macro if I if I chose to. So I, I can still go into here and expand this macro out and see, okay, so this this small arch, this little point at the top is due to, you know, how it's putting together this, uh, you know, this, this cathedral arc. And then these three lines here, here lines connected all together, and it's all just kind of all together as one big contour in the end, but I have, we still have full control to change how this is calculated. We don't have to use the end 
macro if we didn't want to. Uh, opinion, it was just, I, I thought that this macro was doing everything we wanted it to do, so I had against it. So can you uh, create your own macros? Yep. Say uh, some unique shape that you want. Can you create your own? Yep, that's probably the last. Well, okay, the second the last thing that I'm going to show you guys is that um, I have now, from this, all of this, this machining that I did to here for the end, right, um, you know, I'm sure anybody would make a macro out of this, but I, I did it just as, as a proof of concept again. I can create a completely new uh, or you know, or put in whatever random 800 by 400. Why not? So this completely random size. Now, and my users um, here, here, one more thing I wanted to show you guys. These menus are completely customizable. You'll notice here there is on a stove uh, what icon and when I click on that, it says a dot pops up. With, if you guys recall, what were our variables I made in that end? They were TK type, rise, and drill num. So I now made a, basically a macro out of that, uh, the, the complete machine variables and, and geometries of that end that we used before. I've made a macro out of it, and that log is now had now taken those variables that I was changing variables individually and put them to dialogue. So this is what John was kind of talking about. If you guys didn't want to have anybody tinkering with, you know, all the machines on the side, well, we can put this into a macro with a dialogue on top of it, and all the user really has to do is, you know, go through this and select, you know, I want the toe kick to one, and, you know, the right I'm going to leave, and, and you know, let's do this. And we throw this in here, and you can see, boom. To the we had before. You can see the perimeter cut is still going around. It will the number one type, which happens to be, you know, the normal toe kick. And everything is still parametric, right? And if I change it then after the fact, again, I just double click on it and say, okay, I want to use toe kick type too. All right. Needless to say, of course, you can submit this automatically without even thing is the dialogue box right. or is functionality for it. It's called a runner. And the same thing becomes a really automated process. Yeah, that's the last thing I mean it's, Oh, sorry. Um did I was I talking over somebody? Well all everything here can be loaded from the C S V file in the nesting aspect, correct? Yeah, well, that's the last thing, you know it it then depends on, you know, the last thing I was going to show you guys was, was the nesting, of course, but um, it, it all depends to us on how you guys want to load in the data. Now, I, what you've seen so far is kind of an individual user loading up these template files or, or loading in a macro and one by one, uh, you know, which is kind of a manual process. Uh, you know, the more automated process would be if you just gave us like a CS file, or, you know, if we correct, connect it directly to an EP, it is very common, or the, the ERP gives us some information. It tells us something like, okay, lowest template file with, you know, the width and the height, or the width and the length, uh, you know, these, and, you know, potentially it has, you know, toe kick type, and, and you know, like an Excel file, right? Then the toe kick type says the type number two in, in the Excel cell. Uh, then we just load all that information in, and, and the part comes out. You can update it to what you needed for that job at that time. So, um, something that I got up right now because I don't have like a CSD or something that I could load in, um, I put that together. But you potentially quickly look at, you know, saying, uh, Action here if we go to nesting here. So this thing dialogue. You can see, you know, the, ne the nesting dialogue is, is pretty simple. It's just like, uh, uh, you know, our blue optimizer, if you know it. You know, you, you need a couple of things. You need, you need, you need material, you need a couple of information things, um, and then you just nest it up, right? Um, so you can see here some of the examples we have of, of 
you know, just these are the order on the left side here um, that, I cl uh, that I'm clicking on. So you see uh, up under the parts, these are, of course, the parts that I'm loading in. And then if we scroll down, you can then see the nest result. Pretty fairly simple one. Um, I want to show you guys this one because in this example, you can see part in part nesting. So, you know, this was done for a door company uh, called Horizon, uh, uh, Horizon uh, Kitchens. They they kind of have these doors where, where the style and the rail is one piece. And, you know, the center is cut out, and then you can put these these parts in, inside of it, right? So that's what's going on here. We, we miss outdoor contour, and now these parts are here. The part in part nesting is putting rectangular parts, as many as it can, out of that opening in the door. Um, one more example that I, I might want to show is uh, this concept. Hub. And here you can really see that it's Doing, you know what I call now true shape nesting, where it has detected okay, okay there is this outer contour of this uh, a rectangle, and it's directly nested these these two guys together. Uh, you know, arc within the arc, where the two are triangle to you know use as to have much of as efficient yield as it possibly can interesting thing about this one is that this is actually also a nest. If I open this into NCAD, actually also a nest of five axis machining that we're doing. Uh, so let me do that. Oh. Let's see that. Uh, so I might be trying to do something here that was made for, for a different version of NCAD. But you can see, if we had seen the preview, you would have seen that along these lines it would be tilting back and forth because it's it's really in five axis machining. Uh, so that was something that I see saw you guys had been doing by uh, one of the, the, the router bits, you know, so that the profile was correct. So that is that is definitely something that we can do too. So five axis machining is a problem. Um, the last the last thing that I'll show you here in the nesting is you know bring the parts that I had made for you guys so that you guys aren't just seeing some some pre pre made nests. If I make some like a new order here, we can use whatever we want, you know, like on the soda demo potentially. Uh, you can select your you know the multiply of you know you can just multiply out the job so if you you know don't want to run it twice you can just say you know multiply by by two. Um and uh, now if we go to the con demo, we can now say load in those, those FMC files. Looking at the four, so I'm going to load in the three that I made. So these and the customer. So that we had previewed before, and I'm just going to load those in really quickly. Now I've loaded these. these Parts in the ones that we we've seen before. Uh, these are going to, in this case, without the CSV to load in the parametrics, this is going to take the values of what was saved at. So the last time I saved these files from add, that's what what it's going to use. Um, but we can switch switch you know the nesting quantity. So let's say we want to do ten of these ends and uh, you know store now. Sorry, I clicked on the wrong one. We can say, all right, let's nest this up. We're talking about rectangular parts here, so it, it's nothing amazing. But you can hear that, that you know, this one has, you know, revealed on an actual 98%. Uh, these other ones, you know, once trying to put other ones together, we can say that there, there's a little bit of a, you know, unused material here. Uh, but one last thing I want to point out is that this does have a, uh, a pattern, right? so we can potentially, you know, delete this part if we wanted to. Uh, again, now we have a little bit more, you know, space to work with. We can rotate these. We can, if we want, it gives you this option, but you can actually force it to, you know, try to parts over the top of each other. But it does have inbuilt collision detection, so 
it's recognizing here, you know, we shouldn't go over the other parts here. This is the room we have to work um, One to, to look at is potentially this last part here, or this last sheet. If we have one, you can see it only managed to bring one part onto the sheet. So the rest of this, you know, is this just you know, to be thrown away? Well, in this case, we've actually told it to try to utilize the scrap and save it back into the database. So where it's putting this line down, of these pieces are going to be going into our receipts, potentially used later for, for, for a different nest. And that's the basics of the Of course, many options that we can go into, you know, um, it can tabbing, it can do uh, common line cutting, state line cutting, um, you know, it uses it, how much material it expects to use as a is a set that you can manipulate. So those are things that you guys are probably used to from modeling software that <laughs> can, of course, can do as well. There. Yeah, that's pretty much my uh, uh, my my song and dance for you guys. Um, I mean, any questions? Uh, what, you know, what did, what did you see? What are you? Uh, what, what question I have. Um, can you open, like, the, um, for example, can you open that notepad? Yes. So, you, you oh, talk about it. If it to the, the file itself. So, I'm here. And I remember where I'd say that was in Conestoga. Take a day. The reason I'm asking is we, the reason I'm asking is we have some processes right now where one off parts and the our system is opening it and put it real simple they're opening it in notepad replacing the variable mm. saving it out as the job yep. um, that potentially could be a avenues in the CSV because we would have all the parts and we could say load a file correct so Here. I mean that, that's the thing that we actually offer um, so we offer a, a software called data link I don't know John if you've talked to come so about data link but, but link guys. It is a conversion software, so you're not sure what file types we're talking about here. But when we have a converter that can go from, for instance, MBAR files for OMAG and convert them to the FMC files here, which are proprietary to NGAT. Um It's just basically because, like you said, we can open this into Notepad++. Plus Plus. Here's the code for that, that FMC file. And, you know, if we if it's not proprietary, you know, if this it doesn't look like a bunch of gibberish, uh, and actually, yeah. then we can replace that code with whatever we want it to be. So we take the R files or the CIX files from yes, and put them to an FMC files, and boom, you have that same file. And then yeah. do you have it? Oh, do you have it open now? All I'm seeing is. is uh, oh, we, we can't see it. If you have to use FMC code open. And, uh, um, then it's confused. Why, why are you guys not able to see that? It's a big gray, it's like a grayed out box for most yeah. of your screen. Looks like, like, I think I know what's going on. I'm going to stop sharing for a second and reshare. Doesn't your content. I did was accidentally share just in get that dialogue. Oh, there we go. Yeah. See? Okay. okay. So I went to this folder, and, and uh, maybe you guys didn't see that before, but I went to, you know, the Conestoga Woods where I saved those files, and I right click and edit with Notepad++, plus plus, and the code, which, okay, so uh, uh, control and fees there. Uh, the code here, you know, the So potentially went in here and said, you know, I not look at this too closely, just on the fly. You know, if I change here this radius, it changes the type. And my intention is that when I then open that FMC file back into Copus in Canada, that something has changed. Yeah, I do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, because if you actually would go to the top of your variable, we have uh, in our line where the number, like, the numeric value is, we put well, underscores 
with a trigger and then our element in our system, and then they replace it out with a numeric value. Yep. So we actually can't open our our template per se in our software for that until after it drops the these because it's cause the numeric value there. I guess. But it, but it very well. So okay. I'm thinking what what's the best avenue to drop a CSV or to drop the actual parts. Okay, and then it's something to, yeah, to, 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 to That's our, my we, problem. We can my either problem. one, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. I would, I would do the CSV, my first reaction, but uh, open for, for discussion. Yeah. Yeah, you, the you, if I that, Randy. CSV is probably the way I would lean. I just wanted to know if you could, like, for example, Zilog files can't open them in Notepad. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll crash out. Yeah, I think uh, it's, yeah. it's like an, an alpha and file. It's just, yeah, exactly. It's just yeah. uh, a whole bunch of symbols and stuff. Yeah, what, I'm what, sure could, you can open this in Notepad and see it. Right. Yep. And you can, uh, I mean, the the one disadvantage of, of uh, changing now yeah. in an FMC file, which is a text file, it's you're yeah. saying available in the text file, and if you know what you're looking for, you can't change it. Even formal ones, if you wanted to, not a good idea, but potentially doable. I, I think our developers don't actually even have Cobus in yeah. an environment. They just look at the code and they sure. work yeah. in that. Yeah. So, probably you could do that, but then if you want to post process that to the machine, either you funnel it through MCAT again. Which you can do automatically, but you may well go the CSV route. Or what Alex mentioned earlier, we have a conversion program called DataLink, and then in theory you could say, okay, here are FMC files, uh, change certain values in the FMC files automatically uh, because it's a text file. And I run this conversion program and make NPR or CIX or whatever machine code you need. With that conversion program without even going into NCAT anymore. That's possible. That's a route. So, your tool, your tool set up in NCAT? Yeah, so they are set up in NCAT. That was another thing that I uh, I did actually want to show you guys. Is that, you know, I think this is a little better than what you guys have in Alpha. So, I'm putting on a home mag machine here, maybe. That's okay. If I just. That's it, fine. You can see here what what NCAT tries to do with the tools is okay. So first of all, have like a big tool tool library. So all the tools that you'll need for all the machines that you have get put into the library here. Whatever uh, tools are equipped on the specific machines, you go here into you know the machine and edit, and it gives you here uh, in the case two these two big tool changers, and here you have a, a drill block. Right, but uh, you know these board stuff millimeters in this case. You know this one's been very fleshed out. I uh, got a, a handful of tools on it, but you can set this up as realistically, you know, or as close to real life on the machine as possible. You know, so if it only has eight tools, an eight changer, then you would reduce that down. If it has, you know, more and more a drill uh, spindles in in the x direction, then we would just add more to it. And then this allows us to then do kind of you guys were talking about where, where you have that center point. Where I think seven holes at once or something. You do that naturally because it, it's set up, but and it's as long as tool optimization is taking it into account. Then bring down the seven spindles all at once because mm -hmm. it's set up here in the machine, right? So that's kind of I think that does that. On your end, Jeff? Yeah. Oh, that's good. What I'm seeing. Yeah, the last thing I ran was was just the uh, you know a quick you know, preview of a full nest. You know, I think you. Uh, one thing you might see in in the nest now, I might be you know kicking myself in the butt a little bit for showing it, is the optimization. You know, this is uh, not been optimized at 
this point today thing, you know, officially in my opinion, you can see it's doing each one of these, you know, perimeters individually, but tool optimization is something that almost everybody else for and it can be included in, in Copus Inc. to do this a little bit, you know, so what we're seeing. Actually, because, that. All right. At least it's doing the same tool over and over again. You know, the worst I've seen is, you know, if it were to do everything in one part, you know, so doing, yeah, it's doing three tool changes here and then three tool changes. At least it's only doing three tool changes for the whole. And I haven't even tinkered with tool optimizing here for the mm -hmm. So it'll get better. Yeah. For example, you'd be able to optimize the tool path. Uh, yep. I, I actually believe that's not too bad. It's not too bad, yeah. yeah. And I expected it, since you usually had the front the tool optimization, I expected it to do the three changes. And that's the Correct. default, actually, but yeah, I mean, that, if that's something to mention. If, uh, if you guys didn't, uh, there is an option for tool optimization, which uh, I think every single person added on. Uh, from our Cobus ad. If if the tool optimization is not added on, you can still control it. But it, it basically the way it basically does the tool optimization then is that it goes from top to bottom of how it's organized in the list. Uh, in amples, you know, so that gets pretty hard to control doing a best. So I think tool optimization is something to definitely look at. Yeah. Yeah, the great. Like, Go ahead. Generate um, reports or like your nested sheet report. How do you handle that? Are you going to share that within this? Yeah, okay, good question. I did not test that. There is uh, usually an option I have to uh, install, um, but let's see if I did it already for this one. So, a... so let's go back. Where is it? Here with me. File. I think it must be the late plugin. No late plugin. Okay, so unfortunately I don't have a report. So this uses um uh, Windows report reporting services and it looks like I don't have that plugin installed. Um okay. can put the show. Actually show it but I have to find it is uh we have what it outputs, you know, as a default, uh, and mm -hmm. it usually outputs three or four things. So there's, uh, you know, this as you can see, it, it calls it label generation here. So it, it would be, uh, um, its priority is to create labels for you. But as part of these labels, I think this is a misnomer. This is really report generation. Um, what reports is, you know, something that shows you. Uh, you know, the utilization, you know, you can print out the individual patterns on, on a sheet for you to look at. Um, if I find it really quickly, if you guys are, you know, maybe talking with them, then I can send you that in an email as, as a PDF. Is it customizable? In other words, can we get our information onto the report? Yes. Yeah, so it, it, is, it is Windows reporting services, so it's, as long as you, um, you know, have the Windows Reporting Services Editor tool, then you can customize the, the default report or your own default report to, to be whatever we want. Okay. We just have to point it to it, you know? Yeah. So we, we were going to utilize labels. Can you put the image apart on the label? Or is that the, with the reporting service? If you create it, you should be able to put it there. Uh, that's, that's a question I... Um, I haven't been down that route with with Copus because that is something where we do have our own software program for that called Imprint, which we usually go with. So it's kind of a question of, you know, do we do it in NCAT and how it does that? So to the question is that, yes, NCAT can do it. It's just usually we go with, uh, with our own software, which is called Imprint, to do that. Okay. Very good. 
Okay, I heard another question in this. So. Rex, I would say you you need the reports and it's just email. Yeah. They're, they're keep in mind that they're they're just standard reports to be customized. Right, you're gonna see the very default thing with no changes where you know, you know of course if you're customizing it, you're gonna want to put the kind of stuff uh, um look probably on it and then you know you can I uh, but pretty much yeah. change exact you know, everything that's in there to to be in its own location or Use different types, etc. Different. Okay. On that label, I only confirm with Alex that we we typically for printing have uh, the software solution that you print is uh, yeah, your software product. Uh, NCAT, by the way, is the only one we do not make. Uh, the only uh, software Eurosoft sells and supports that's not made at the soft okay. office. In Carrier's Carolina, but that puts NCAT on some sort of pedestal. It's just the company is a yeah. good product. For, 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 for certain things like labels, we prefer using ours. We think that monthly, that not the, the sharpest pencil in the, in the NCAT drawer, uh, the label. So we, we have our own solution, which we think is superior. Okay. Yeah, the labels are. The, I think the actual answer to your question is, is simple. I mean, the labels are, you know, how you set the labels are exactly like the report. So it would again be in the Windows reporting services tool. Yeah, and okay. you guys just set it, it up to to load in an image. Now every time it's generated by Cobus, it exports uh, MP or an EMF of Part and just have a part a uh, location on the label which is you know load in the BMP file I will then show you part. I think that's the actual answer. Okay. It's it's actually exactly the same right. as in Blue well, Alex you can okay. just build to print labels just using the label report, but it's it's the same you printing the office and stack with labels it's not as good as using Imprint is a separate right. software. But I okay. shut up. No. Good. I don't have any more questions that I can think of right now. Looks good. Yeah, if you think of anything, you know, just, just email it to me. I got to follow up anyway, like I said, with the, uh, the default uh, PDF, so I'll, I'll find that. And we're either working on, on this, you know, maybe it's easier to get it working and, and you know, send you the reports for, you know, the, the next report. Well, I'll see what I can find and, and send you the of what the default reports will be. Okay. All right. Uh, appreciate you doing the recording, too. Uh, this is going to be great if um, Mike Bullock can take a look. Yeah, I recorded something, and at some point I said, okay, I'm sick of listening to this Alex guy talking and cut out. <laughs> I think it'll be good, yeah. And, I can... and then, uh, course, conversations on our end, just to kind of discuss what we saw and what we liked, and, um, yeah, get you guys some feedback. Okay. Good. Really appreciate the time again and, and doing the demo. Well, th thanks for your guys' time as well, of course. Uh, and, uh, you know, like you said, I uh, have uh, discussion and what will be just uh, keep it an eye and an ear out for to hear back from you guys. That's okay. great. Thank you guys. Thank we'll you. Talk again soon. Yep, thanks. Take care. All right. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye.